you know what, Dara, you can start and then I'll just let people in as they come. Awesome. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so um, I'll just start by, by introducing who I am for those of you who don't know who I am. Um, my name is Dara Kearney. I'm an Irish professional poker player. I learned poker at a much older age than I'm going to guess most of you are um, 15 years ago. And um, I've been a professional for the last 14 years, predominantly a, a, an online player, um, although I have played a decent amount live as well. Um, in the last few years, I've started doing more um, coaching and content um, on the co-host of the Chip Race podcast. I've written a couple of strategy books, uh, three strategy books with Barry Carter, um, of which the latest one is the one on screen, Endgame Poker Strategy. The first book was about satellites specifically, which was a format that I concentrated um, on online for years in my career. Um, the second book was on PKOs specifically. And the third book is on ICM in general. What all three books have in common is they don't really teach you how to play poker. They kind of assume you already know how to play. They just talk about the uh, strategic adjustments you have to make. For example, in the satellite book, if it's a satellite, how satellites are different from normal tournaments. If it's a PKO, how, what, what, what that means for your strategy. And in the latest book, it's specifically focusing on ICM adjustments that you have to make near the bubble of tournaments or last two tables of tournaments, um, that sort of stuff. So um, obviously I'm not going to go through ICM in extensive detail in, in, in this, but, I'm, but I want to focus on some of the more um, interesting or fundamental spots, I guess, of ICM. It's while you can sort of learn ICM by rote and go, you know, well, we shove a bit wider in these spots and we call tighter in these spots, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's kind of useful to understand um, fundamentally what ICM is and why it changes the strategy. So um, at the start of this presentation, which was put together by my wonderful co-author, um, Barry Carter. So he, he, he leaned fair, fairly heavily into the snail theme here, but um, we'll start just with, by looking at what ICM is. So imagine you have a thousand dollar buy an MTT with a thousand starting chips and a hundred runners. Um, uh, so you're paying a thousand dollars for a thousand starting chips, assuming you have li leaving skill um, to, to one side. You know, obviously, if you're a more skilled player, your starting stack is actually worth more than a thousand dollars. But leaving that aside, an, an average player, let's say, is buying a thousand chips for a thousand dollars and also ignoring the rake that means that each chip is worth one dollar if you're lucky enough to win the tournament and let's say first prize is twenty five thousand dollars that means you have amassed all of the chips in the tournament hundred thousand chips but you're only getting twenty five thousand dollars so each chip is now worth 25 cents so the question is what happened where, where did the remaining money go um and where the money went is basically to on obviously to all the other payouts. Every time somebody is, is paid out, they leave the tournament with zero in chips. So the amount of chips in the tournament remains the same, but the price pool shrinks. Um, and that's the easiest way to think about why uh, chips devalue as tournaments go on. Um, let's take an let's take a, an example now um, where um, there are 11 players left and um, we have the different potential payouts from, we're paying 10 and we have 11 people left. So it's the bubble. Um, the stacks diverge. The, the chips, the chip leader has 30,000 in chips um, and actually second in chips has 30,000 as well. So we have joint chip leaders. And then we have the other players who have, varying stacks from 8,000 down to three short stacks who have 2,000 each. And we've just put up a, an example payout structure there. Um, so first is getting the 25,000 that we talked about earlier. Second is getting 18,000 all the way down to 10, who gets 2,000 and 11 is going to be the unfortunate bubble. If you put this through an ICM calculator, um, you'll find that the, the two joint chip leaders have 17,415 cents so $415.67 in equity. Um, and you go all the way down to the um, the short stacks and they have $4,554. So if you divide 30,000 by 17,415, that means the chip leader, each, each chip in his stack is worth 58 cents. Whereas the short stacks who have 4,454 in equity, 
um, and only 2,000 chips, each of their chips is worth $2.28. Um, and this makes the point that there's not a linear relation between your stack size and your equity. Um, as you get closer and closer to bubbles, this becomes even more pronounced. At the start of the tournament, everybody had you know, exactly 1,000 chips, which they'd paid $1,000 for, so each chip was worth $1. But now we have a situation where the chip leader who has amassed 30,000 in chips, their chips are only worth 58 cents each. And the short stacks are actually, their chips are worth $2.28. And we sometimes refer to this as a punishment factor. You're essentially being punished for being the big stack. Your chips are worth less. And conversely, you're being rewarded for being the short stack because your chips are, are now worth more. Um, in other words, the more chips you have, the less each one in particular is worth. And that's the punishment factor I was referring to. What that means for strategy at this point of a tournament or any point where ICM is a major factor is that losing essentially hurts more or costs more than winning feels good or winning adds to your equity. Um, therefore, when you have a lot of chips, you can take more risks and be more aggressive because you're, you, you are actually risking less um, you know, when, you, when you bet 1,000, 2,000 chips. Whereas when somebody who bets or who only has 2,000 chips, uh, puts those 2,000 chips into the pot, um, they're, risking, they're actually risking more in monetary terms. Um, so when you have a short stack, your strategic incentive, your main strategic incentive is to preserve your chips and be cautious. Um, okay, now I'm going to get onto bubble factor. This is a useful concept to assess exactly how extreme ICM is in different situations. So bubble factor is a formula which shows you how you always win less than you stand to lose in poker tournaments. So in other words, doubling up never gives you the same equity as uh, losing all your chips costs you. And the bubble factor essentially measures um, the discrepancy between those two factors. It's important to know, or at least to be able to estimate in game what your bubble factor is, because it determines how tight you should play or how aggressive you should be against players you cover. When you have a very low bubble factor, like a chip leader typically has, you can afford to be much more aggressive and also um, use your chip stack to pressurize um, players who have a higher bubble factor. But when you have a very high bubble factor, you have to basically be just, just be very cautious. And bubble factor is a very simple concept and formula. It's literally just the equity that you're risking Divided, divided by the equity that you will gain if you win. Um, and once you know your bubble factor, you know the equity that you require to call an all-in. It's going to be your bubble factor divided by your bubble factor plus one. Um, bubble factor obviously can, can never be less than one. Um, at the start of a tournament, bubble factor will be very, 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 very slightly over one for everybody in the tournament. But as you get near to the final table, for example, or the actual bubble, it'll escalate. And exactly how high your bubble factor is will depend on your stack size. When you're short stacked, it's going to be higher than when you're the chip leader. Um, but irrespective of, of, of what it is, uh, you will. this is how you work out the equity that you need. So for example, if your bubble factor is two, meaning that when you lose, it costs you twice as much as when you win, then the equity you'll need to call an all-in, for example, will be two over two plus one, which is 66.6%. Uh, so rather than 50%, which is what you would require if, if chip EV was the only consideration, um, you would now need 66%. And uh, here's an example from hand one of a sit and go. These are the tournaments that I specialized in at the start of my career. 10 man sit and goes, everybody starts with the same stack um, half the prize pool goes to first, 30% goes to second, 20% goes to third. What happens if two people get it all in first hand? Um, well, if you, if you rerun the ICM calculator after the situation where one of them wins the first hand, so they double from 10,000 to 20,000, and the other player obviously goes from 10,000 down to zero, what you find is the equity of the player who's doubled up has increased from $10 to to $18.44. So even at the start of a sit and go, um, you can see 
that ICM is, start, is starting to play a major consideration. Um, John Van Fleet makes a very good point. The bubble factor can be less than one in PKOs. Um, I mean, essentially, the bubble factor is more than one, but the bounty factor pulls it back. In a PKO, you have two different um, forces pulling in different directions. ICM pulls you in one direction to, uh, to, to make you play tighter, but the fact that you can win a bounty if you cover somebody pulls you the other way. You can combine those two into one, um, one measure and call that the bubble factor, um, and, and that can certainly be below one. Um, it's 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 not unusual for the combined bubble factor, let's call it that, in a PKO for the chip leader against a short stack to be as low as zero point eight. Um, but but I'm but but I'm referring to just purely the um, the the ICM aspect. I'm not I'm not refer, I'm not talking about PKOs here. So to return to the example, when somebody doubles up first hand of a sit and go, the equity goes up eight dollars forty four. And the equity of the losing player goes obviously from $10 down to zero. So they've lost $10. The winner has gained $8.44. And so the question is, well, where, where's the other $1.56 gone? And the other $1.56 is essentially divided equally between everybody at the table. So the eight players who folded hand number one have actually increased their equity by 19 cents. Um, and that's an important concept to realize as well. In, in, in tournaments, you actually make, uh, when ICM is a factor, you actually make money when you fold. Um, in, in a cash game, you know, it doesn't benefit you at all to fold. Your, stack, your chip stack remains exactly the same. But in a tournament, if two players get it all in and one of them busts, your equity goes up. Um, so to, uh, to lean into that example a bit more, as I said, player one, when they when they move all in is risking ten dollars equity to 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 gain only eight dollars forty four, so their bubble factor is ten divided by eight forty four, so it's one point one eight. And if you remember the uh, the formula for what equity we require um, to break even, it's bubble factor divided by bubble factor plus one. So one point one eight over two point one eight is fifty four percent. So that means that for, for the player who's calling off, they need fifty four percent equity to um to make the call so that kind of makes the point that you know the the pot odds we're being offered are are obviously one to one so we would only need 50 percent equity but in a tournament even at the start of a sit and go where people would often think well there's no icm because it's the start but actually there is icm and this also applies obviously to multi-table tournaments albeit to a lesser degree um but you can see that even at the start of a sit and go uh, the ICM factor is fairly significant. You need this 4% extra in equity uh, to make a call off. Okay, now let's consider the actual bubble. So um, we still have the same payouts, obviously 50, 30, 20. Um, we still have 100,000 chips in play. We have a chip leader who has 40,000. And we have, just for the purpose of this example, we've made the other three stacks equal. Obviously, in, in, in the real world, this is extremely unlikely, but uh, what, what we're focusing on here is the difference between the chip leader and the shortest stacks. So um, let's imagine two of these players who have the shorter stacks get it all in against each other. So player three and four, they both have 20,000 in chips. They get it all in. The player who wins, let's say it's player three who wins, he goes from... Uh, 22, 33 in equity to now he's one of the 40,000 stacks on the bottom on bottom table. So his, his equity increases from 22, 33 to 35, 67, um, which is a gain of 13, 34. Obviously, the loser has lost the full $22.33 that they started in equity with. So player three is risking $22.33 to win $13.34. And if we do the calculation on that, we divide the 22.33 by 13.34, we can find that the bubble factor is $1 and, oh, sorry, is 1.67. Um, and that translates into a uh, break-even equity of 1.67 divided by 2.67, which is 63%, which is, 13% over what we would need if ICM isn't a factor. Sometimes that difference between what we actually need, the 63% and the 
equity we, we would need if ICM wasn't a factor, the 50% is referred to as risk premium. It's the additional equity we need for, because of what we're risking. It's important to realize that different players have different bubble factors against each other. Um, and here, here we have another example where we have nine players left. They have different stacks from 100,000 down to 10,000. And if we put this into an ICM calculator, we'll, we can work out their equity. You can do a grid then of the bubble factor against the different players. So for example, when seat nine, who has 10,000, plays against seat eight, they have a bubble factor of 1.19. But when they play against the chip leader, they have a bubble factor of 1.4. And you'll see that when you're the short stack, the more chips the other person has, the higher your bubble factor is against them, the more equity you need to break even if you get it all in against them. Um, you can kind of think of this intuitively that if you were given the choice between doubling up against a guy who has the same chips as you or the chip leader, which would you prefer? And the answer is obviously you would rather double up against the other guy who has 10,000 because you knocked him out. You immediately ladder, you increased your equity by more. Whereas if you double up to the chip leader, okay, you move up to 20,000 they move down to 90,000, but it's not the same. It's, it, it's not as good for you as doubling up to the other short stack that you get to knock out. It's not even as good as doubling up to the 20,000 stack, because if you double up to the 20,000 stack, you become 20, you, you get to 20,000, but you move him down to 10,000. So you actually move from being joint bottom to being seven of nine. And that's why um, the bubble factor against the 20K stack, if you're the short stack is only 1.27. And as the stack size increases, you can see the bubble factor also increases. Um, okay, now let's focus on the chip leader. You can see that the chip leader has a very, very low bubble factor against the short stack. Because if they lose, they go from 10,000, from 100,000 down to 90,000, um, which is no big deal. So you can see there's, there, there, there's a complete imbalance here where when the chip leader gets in against the short stack, um, their bubble factor is only 1.05, but the short stack's bubble factor is 1.4. Um, so the chip leader doesn't, doesn't really mind, can play very aggressively against the short stack. Um, they obviously don't want to lose 10,000, but it's not the end of the world if they lose 10,000. But the, the short stack has to play quite cautiously against the chip leader, much more cautiously than they need to do against the other short stacks. You can see that as the chip leader, when you're playing against short stacks, your bubble factor is pretty low. But for example, well, in, in general, the more chips they have, the higher your bubble factor will be. And you know, if you if you play a pot against the um, second biggest stack, you actually have a very high bubble factor, two point one three, which is actually higher than, for example, the short stack has against you. Um, that's because, and you can think about that. Like if you play, if you get all in against the guy who's second in chips, if you lose, you're going to be down to ten thousand. Um, and that's that that that's a much bigger hit than the benefit of going up to 190. So you need this 2.13. Uh, you, uh, you can you can look at this table and you can you can quickly get a sense that the, the people who are who 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 really have the most ICM misery are the medium stacks against bigger stacks. The highest bubble factor possible on this table is the mediums uh, the second in chips bubble factor against the chip leader. He's got a bubble factor of 2.56, um, which means he has to play incredibly cautiously. Um, and it's generally the case that anybody who plays against the stack which covers them is going to have a very high bubble factor. They're the highest. So the chip leader and the short stack, while they have different bubble factors against different players, they, have, they will tend to have the lowest bubble factors at the table. It's the medium stacks. Um, who are, who are under the most ICM pressure, particularly when they play stacks either that can damage them severely or actually eliminate them. Um, now let's talk about the bubble factor, how it changes over the course of an MTT. And this is not a scientific graph. This is just for illustrative purposes, but it shows you typically what the average stack 
what the bubble factor of the average stack in the Sunday Million. This graph is from um, a book called Kill Everyone uh, by Lee Nelson and, and a few others. And it, it's a graphical representation of, I believe it's from the Sunday Million, where a thousand players are paid, what the bubble factor of the average stack would be. Now, remember, the bubble factor depends on your stack. Short stacks have higher bubble factors than the big stacks and so, so this would be the medium stack, the, the exactly average stack. So at the start of the, of the tournament, ICM is, is very low. It's barely over one. And then it rises. It starts to rise slowly. And as you approach the bubble, it starts to rise much more steeply. And it comes to a peak on the actual money bubble, or at least its first peak. And in this, in this specific example, this specific tournament, this specific payout structure, for, for an average stack, it will be 1.5 something on the bubble. Then the minute the bubble bursts, it drops very, very sharply. And it continues to drop until near the first pay jump. And then it starts to rise again. And then after that pay jump, it goes down. So you have this jagged saw effect of rise, rise, fall, rise, fall, rise, fall, et cetera, et cetera. But the overall trend is down until you get to the second last table. And on the second last table, it starts to rise again. And this is very important to understand because a lot of people think that ICM is somehow directly correlated to the next pay jump. And they think, well, if the next pay jump is big, ICM is a really, really big factor. But if the next pay jump is minor, it's not a big factor. We can, if you think back to my, um, my example from the first hand of a sit and go, you can see that that clearly isn't true because it, it in a 10-man sit-and-go where three players are paid, the first, in inverted commas, pay jump from 10 to 9th is zero. The next pay jump from 9th to 8th is zero. 7 to 6th is zero, et cetera, all the way up. The first, pay, the first actual pay jump is fourth to third. And yet at the start of uh, a 10-man sit-and-go, the, um, the bubble factor is, is, is already pretty high. So it's important to understand that ICM really starts to kick in on, on the second table and it rises, 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 usually to the absolute peak on the final table bubble with 10 players left. And then as every player is eliminated thereafter on the final table, it drops until eventually you get down to heads up where there are two players left and now there's no ICM. This is the only time in, a, in an MTT where the bubble factor is actually one, exactly one. And you're basically just playing for chips because when you get heads up, you have two players playing against each other for the difference between first and second. Um, so there's no ICM anymore. Now, this can be counterintuitive to a lot of people. A lot of people think that ICM ratchets up as you get less and less players and the pay jumps get bigger, but actually it's it goes the other way uh, around. On a final table, the ICM reduces with each elimination. So how do we use bubble factor? Um, he, 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 these are just some very general heuristics. If, 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 you, if you don't understand ICM and you don't want to spend ages calculating and you just have a rough kind of intuitive idea of what, what your bubble factor is, oh, I think it's high in this case, or I think it's low in this case, how would you work from that to how you should adjust your strategy? And these are the major heuristics. Um, you can attack players you cover because they have a higher bubble factor than you by virtue of the fact that you cover them. Um, you can take more risks with a big stack um, because you get basically pressure. Uh, you should avoid chip leader versus chip leader confrontations. When the two stacks are very close together, even if you're the chip leader, you still have significant ICM as well. So it's not in your interest to play big pots in those cases. Um, similarly, middle stack versus middle stack contribution confrontations are very bad for both parties involved when ICM is a factor. And if you're short stacked, attack the other short stacks because you benefit much more from doubling up to a short stack than you do from doubling up against the chip leader. Now I'm going to focus on another um, implication of ICM, um, specifically what it means for late registration. And I've been preaching this for years and people said, no, you're wrong. It's, it's always bad to late register. It's terrible. Um, you, you, you're losing money when you late register. But 
there is a there is an ICM benefit to late registration, which more and more people have come to understand now. And to to to, to the point where you know people like Mike Manasau are freaking out that uh, um, people are allowed to register so late. And to illustrate this, let's do an ICM calculation. <clears throat> let's just imagine that we start with ten players in a ten man sit and go, and this is the payouts. And then when we get down to five players. And they, for the purpose of this example, they all have equal stacks. An 11th player is allowed to register. They late register. So their 10 additional dollars goes into the prize pool. So the new payouts are 55, 33, and 22. If we do the ICM calculation, we'll find that for their $10, they're getting $10.87 in equity because they're, because they're registering after people have been eliminated. Now, this is obviously a very specific example for a 10-person sit-and-go. But the same holds true in all MTTs. As soon as somebody is eliminated from the tournament, anybody who late registers benefits from that in equity terms. It'll ob obviously, if it's a thousand runner tournament and only five people have been eliminated, the effect would be very, very minor. But you know, we all know we we all know um, online tournaments where late registration is possible to to the point where half the remaining field are getting paid, for example. Then the ICM benefits, the equity that you gain from that registration will be in this sort of region. Um, I mean, I've even registered right onto bubbles or, or on one memorable occasion, right into the money um, in an online tournament. Um, and anytime you do that, you do gain ICM equity. The more players who have been eliminated already and the closer you are to the bubble, the greater that gain will be. Um, we also did a calculation for a 33-player MTT, where 15 players remain. And uh, it's a 10,000 starting stack. And let me just quickly do them. Yeah, it's a, it's a um, 10,000 starting stack. Six people are being paid. Um, 15, um, 15 remain. Well, actually, the, sorry, 14 remain from the original. And then another guy, a 34th player, comes in, pays his $10 for his starting stack. And how much is stack, his stack worth? If you run the ICM, you'll find his stack is actually worth $12.17. Now, that's a very significant jump. That's 21% in free ROI for that player just for late registering. Um, so you can see that as the... As the tournament size increases, this, this, this effect actually becomes bigger. Okay, now, okay, so late registering is good, obviously, except in PKOs. That's a very important uh, caveat to put on that. If you, when you late register a PKO, you, as a, 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 a certain section of the, of the prize pool has already been paid out. So you're actually paying for less prizes than you were at the start of the tournament. Um, so that's bad. But in a non-PKO, it's there's always an ICM benefit to um, to late registering. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to talk about final table deals, and we're going to look at this from a few particular aspects. Um, what would you want to deal as the chip leader? What would you want to deal as C three? What would you want to deal? What would you be happy with as the shorty? We're going to use this example where first price is four hundred ninety dollars, second price is three hundred twenty, third is one eighty and all the way down, and these are the stacks. Now, these are questions. Imagine these were the stacks and you had the 200K and without being able to do the ICM, what do you think a fair deal would be for you? What would you want to be able to deal? Similarly, what if you were the medium stack? You've got 120K. And what would you be happy with as the shorty? This is a thought experiment because uh, which, which, which would become for reasons that will become obvious later. But I think as chip leader, a lot of people would say, well, I probably want significantly more than second um, because I'm the chip leader. Um, you know, I, some, some chip leaders might even have a realistic expectation of they should get close to first prize because they're the chip leader. As the medium stack, I think a lot of people, uh, when you ask them, they tend to anchor it to, the, to their position. So they would say, well, maybe 180 is what I should get or a bit more than that. And the short stack, you know, and they are significantly short. Even if they double up, they're still going to be short. The short stack might be happy with not much more 
than um, the next payout. So let's look at what the actual fair distribution is. This is the fair distribution. So you can let's start with the chip leader. As I said, the ch pe people, when they're the chip leader, they often sort of anchor to second place in these scenarios. And they think, well, I should at least get second place because I'm chip leader. In fact, I should get more than second place. But actually, the equity of the chip leader in this example is worth less than second place. And that's because, you know, a lot can go wrong from, from five down to one. You're, you're not guaranteed second place even. Now let's look at the, mid, the middling stack. As I said, I think what people, when they have this kind of stack, they often anchor to themselves to the fact, well, I'm third of five and third is worth 180. So 180 seems about the right number. But you can see 180 is not the right number. It significantly underestimates in this case. Um, our equity is actually 244. This is even more pronounced when you consider the short stack. The short stack, who is, as I said, the significant short stack, even if they double, they'll still be short. But their actual equity is worth a lot more than fifth place. In fact, it's worth more than fourth place, which I think a lot of people wouldn't realize in these spots. Um, the reason for this is um, the finished distributions, wh 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 where you will come, if everybody has exactly the same skill and those were the stacks, th this is where the different players will come um, based on ICM calculations. So if we start with the chip leader, well, in fact, any of the players, their chances of winning will, assuming equal skill, will be exactly in proportion to the amount of chips they have. Now, the chip leader, while he is the chip leader, only has 32.3% of the chips. So they will only win 32.3% of the time. The short stack only has 6.5% of the chips, so they'll only win 6.5% 6, 6 of the time. Uh, the chip leader will come second, 27.4%, third, 21.4%, fourth, 14%, and fifth, 4.9%. This, incidentally, is another way of thinking about why when your equity doubles, sorry, when your chip stack doubles, your equity doesn't. When you double your chip stack, say you're this player, you obviously, well, no, say you're the chip leader, you obviously double the your chance of winning the tournament because that's always in proportion to the amount of chips you have. But you don't double your chances of finishing the other positions, they'll actually go down because each of these rows has to obviously sum to 100. So if this goes up significantly, the others must go down between them to the same degree. Um, and actually, so I think people tend to overestimate how often the chip leader wins or comes second. Um, and they tend to underestimate how often the fifth player doesn't come last, let's say. If you're the significant short stack here, you will actually only come fifth just over half the time. You'll make it up to 14th, 18% of the time. You'll get into the top, you'll, you'll finish third 11%, second 8.1%, et cetera. So that pretty much brings me to the end. If you guys have any questions, um, now is the time to, sh to, to, to ask them. Thanks, Lara. And uh, congratulations, Lara. I presume that is you who, uh, who won the ladies' event. Okay, so uh, yeah, if, if um, as I said, this is the book that I've written, and um, this is my blog, if you guys want to ever check out my blog, and um, yeah, thanks everybody, and uh, good luck. Before you guys go, first of all, I want to say thank you to uh, Dara for doing this absolutely informative seminar, it was awesome. Um, I have four copies of, uh, digital copies of your book there with Barry. Um, and what we'll do is if you want to just shout out four random numbers between one and 10, Dara, I will, uh, we'll get some winners and we'll give out four copies of your book. Awesome. Okay. Well, let's do this in a transparent way. Um, so I'll just use a random.org. We'll go one to a thousand. Should we go one to 10,000 in case it, put, it spits out two the same? Well, it's got to be because okay. we're just doing it for the people that are here. Okay, so one so to 10, eight, eight one nine, to, five, one are the yeah. four numbers. Eight, nine, five, one. Yeah. 
Okay, so we got. Lara, if you can message me, you want a copy of Dara's book. Uh, that's the move. You want a copy of Dara's book. Uh, Joanne, you want a copy of Dara's book. And then Captive 8, you want a copy as well. So if you guys just message me um, on Discord, then we will uh, get you guys all set up with a digital copy of Dara's book. And that's from him and Barry. Um, Dara, we really, really appreciate that seminar. It was so well put together. Um, I can't thank you enough for, uh, for doing this for us. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you next one.